Hello, everybody. Peter Maravellis here. I hope this finds you all safe and well. On behalf of City Lights booksellers and publishers, I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that follows in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the time of the pandemic. We continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums moving into the summer season and hopefully towards a COVID-free era. This evening, we are delighted to be celebrating the launch of an important new book. It is titled Inflamed, Deep Medicine in the Anatomy of Injustice. It is authored by Rupa Maria and Raj Patel, and it is published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. This is a groundbreaking book which illuminates the hidden relationships between our biological systems and the profound injustices of our political and economic systems. Together, Rupa Maria and Raj Patel have combined the latest scientific research and scholarship on the globalization to reveal the links between health and structural injustices and offer a new deep medicine, that of the decolonization of our bodies. Tonight's event is being co-presented in conjunction with the Association of Ramatish Ohlone, the Do No Harm Coalition, Health Justice Commons, and San Francisco Bay Physicians for Social Responsibility. To make an opening statement and acknowledgement, I'd like to welcome now Greg Castro from the Association of Ramatish Ohlone. It is a great honor to have you here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Hi, it's Panikan. Thank you. Kershatuhi, uh, Mishishtu, Shamo Sakish. Uh, greetings to you in the language of my ancestors. Uh, my name is Greg Castro. I'm Totral Slinen, Rumson, and Ramatush Ohlone, uh, Haney, Hersha, Pesha, Walrap. Welcome to the homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone people. That's the uh, greeting we have now come up with for the land that we have been born from and that we are now once again a part of and being caretakers and stewards of. And that is uh, very much a, an allied effort uh, that I'm proud to share with uh, people like Rupa and Raj. And uh, you're gonna hear a lot of today about the thought patterns and the framework under which uh, we can accomplish that. So thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I appreciate your presence. And I encourage you all, wherever you are in the universe, to know and, and say gratitude to the people of the land that you're on and uh, know who they are and identify with them. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that we will be posting links in the chat function of your Zoom dashboard with which you may purchase books Towards the end of the evening, we will be featuring a Q&A, so please post your questions and comments in that same chat function. Uh, ASL interpretation for this evening's event is being offered by Sarika Mehta and Rory Burton, our interpreting team. I really wanna thank them for being here tonight. Uh, at this moment, I'd like to offer some background for our authors. Dr. Rupi Maria is a physician, activist, mother, and composer. She is an associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco where she practices and teaches internal medicine. Her research examines the health impacts of social systems from agriculture to policing. She is a co-founder of Do No Harm Coalition, a collective of health workers committed to addressing disease through structural change. She is the composer and front woman also for the band Rupa and the April Fishes, whose music was described by the legendary Gil Scott Herond as liberation music. Raj Patel is a research professor at the University of Texas at Austin's Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, a professor in the university's Department of Nutrition, and a research associate at the Rhodes University in South Africa. He is the author of Stuffed and Starved, the New York Times bestselling The Value of Nothing, and co-author of A History of the World in Seven Cheap Things. A James Beard Leadership Award winner, he is completing a film on the global food system and is a leading thinker and organizer around the Green New Deal. He serves on the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems and has advised governments on causes and solutions to the crises of sustainability worldwide. So please join us now in giving them a warm welcome. I just wanna say thank you to everybody and especially thank you to our um, 
Indigenous farm elder Greg Castro for joining us. It's been a real honor. I was born and raised in Ramatishaloni territory. I'm a practicing physician at UCSF, which is in Yalamu, um, an ancient village of the Ramatishaloni people. I'm living and working right now. I'm, I'm talking to you today from occupied and ceded uh, territory of Huchin in across the Bay, Trochenyo Ohlone territory. It is a real honor to be here today with you to talk about this book and to celebrate. Um, I wish we were all together in person, breathing the same particles and molecules and microbes, but unfortunately we're not. Um, and I um, wanted to just introduce our partners here who are um, joining us today to help um, sponsor this event. Um, first, there's the Do No Harm Coalition. Our medical students are uh, fervently busy um, working. There's um, eviction issues happening in San Francisco right now, um, but we are a collective of healthcare workers committed to um, advancing health through structural change. And so I, I'm very appreciative to all the um, different um, people in training and healthcare workers who have been a part of that coalition, which grew from five of us to now about 2000 of us. Um, so it's a very exciting, very exciting movement. And I want to in, um, introduce uh, Mordecai from Health Justice Commons to tell us a little bit about what you all do. Hi Rupa, hi Raj, hi everyone. It's a real gift to be here with all of you. I also am zooming in from Ohlone territory. Um, Xochenyo, um, Ohlone Territory, um, occupied and unseated. And um, we're really, really um, honored to be able to be co-sponsoring this gathering for this amazing, this amazing book that is essential reading for our times. The Health Justice Commons works at the intersections of disability, racial, gender, climate, and economic justice to center and uplift communities most harmed and marginalized by the medical industrial complex to lead in reimagining and redesigning healthcare. We provide health justice training, engage in movement building, and incubate community-led alternatives aimed at disrupting and transforming the medical industrial complex while alleviating the health burdens of social injustice, environmental racism, and the legacies of intergenerational trauma driven by settler colonialism and capitalism. Thank you so much, Mordecai. Do you wanna say some more about your work? Yeah, I, we're, we're a group of survivors of medical violence and injustice. We're majority disabled, queer, BIPOC, and low-income folks. And if you want to join our movement, you are always welcome. The Do No Harm Coalition and Rupa and Raj are close collaborators and partners and accomplices of ours. We have some upcoming events this month and next month if you want to join us virtually to be COVID safe. We have a rad healers and frontline healthcare workers gathering on October uh, on August 26th, and we also have an online in-depth popular education course, Understanding and Transforming the MIC, which starts September 23rd. And you can find out more on our website, health just, healthjusticecommons.org. Thank you again so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Rupa and Raj. Thank you. And um, uh, Van Nguyen from is Health Justice Commons as well, correct? Oh, I don't see Van Nguyen. Okay, so Julie uh, Lindo from uh, the San Francisco Bay Chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility. Thank you, Rupa. Um, I too am zooming in from Ohlone land. And we are honored to be co-sponsoring this important event and congratulate you, Rupa and Raj, on your new book. I'd like to tell you a little bit about San Francisco Bay Physicians for Social Responsibility. SF Bay PSR organizes physicians and other health professionals to defend health and demand racial, social, and environmental justice. By combining the power of community activism with the knowledge and credibility of health professionals, we promote public policies that support our intertwined areas of concentration, environmental health and climate crisis, 
nuclear weapons abolition and military budget reductions, social and racial injustices, and the health burdens of vulnerable communities, and the education of the public and the next generation of health professionals. To that end, we host monthly public events and would like to invite all of you, non-physicians are welcome, to join our next racial equity reading group discussion of Inflamed, led by Dr. Rupa Maria on Wednesday, August 25th at 7.45 p.m. And by the way, it's at a later time for mothers who have small children who need to be put to bed before the mothers are able to attend. <laughs> so that's why it's at such a late time. Um, to join, please visit our events page at sfbaypsr.org, and I will post the links in the chat. Thank you so much. Really looking forward to this event. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm going to bring my buddy Raj up here now. Uh, Raj, uh, this is basically how we wrote this book was um, being on these uh, FaceTime calls, you and Austin, me here. Um, do you want to say hello? I do. Uh, and I, <laughs> I, I, first of all, I, I just want to, to, to thank you, Rupa, for uh, bringing such an amazing group of people uh, together in Occupied and Lonely Territory. Uh, and uh, to thank all the comrades who are here on behalf of all of us. I mean, you know, it, it, the, 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 it, I mean, it, it's amazing to scroll through the participants list and firstly for it to take so long uh, and then to see so many comrades from, from so much of our, our, our shared histories here with us this evening. Um, and I, 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 I'm particularly uh, pleased and honored that uh, many of the people who made this book possible are with us this evening. Um, whether you know, that, that's Eric Chinsky and Deborah Gim from uh, FSG, who, without whom this book would just not exist in the form that it does. It would be much less readable, much less interesting, much less ready to wrestle with the difficult questions that we do. Uh, and that's all thanks to uh, the, the amazing team at FSG. Uh, and, uh, and also to, to, to thank our wonderful folk behind the scenes. Uh, uh, people don't know this about books, but we spent more time writing the proposal for this book than we spent writing the book. Uh, and uh, Chris Dahl and Carolina Sutton uh, made it possible for us to have a proposal that was worthy of Deborah and Eric. Uh, and we, we just wanted very much to thank them. Uh, and above all now, want to thank you world, comrades, all of you who have joined us this evening, uh, whether you're uh, you know, in the background, filling stock at City Lights, uh, whether you are part of the amazing uh, signing team who has to deal with me speaking a mile a minute. Uh, similarly, Van Nguyen and the captioning, the captioning team, thank you so much for all you're doing for us this evening. Uh, so hello, and thank you for being here. So we're gonna we we thought it'd be fun for us um, and maybe fun for you <laughs> for us to interview each other. Um, yes, cheers, Raj. First of all, cheers. Um, <laughs> yes, and to to talk to each other, um, to ask each other some questions about the the book, um, the process of writing the book, um, and then to um, open up questions from the audience about about this work. Um, it was a real privilege for me to write this book with Raj, who I met one day when I was um, a fish on a stage with my band, the April Fishes, and he was a GMO tomato protesting Monsanto, um, dressed up as a GMO tomato. And from that, I remember the first time we had a coffee down the street from where we both lived in San Francisco. And you asked me such an interesting question, Raj. You asked me, how do I maintain my hope in the face of my activism and in the places that I was going and the communities I was working with, um, how do I maintain hope? Um, and that was such a, a, a question that's come back to me over the many years that we've known each other in the many circumstances I've been in as a physician and an activist and, and an artist. Um, but one thing I um, just love about the work that we've done is the, the, the real optimism that we infused um, as we, wrestled with these issues. Um, so I'm gonna start with a question for you, uh, Dr. Patel. Um, I want to know, 
you know, with all your amazing work you do in food systems and um, economics and looking at, um, you know, social, political ecologies, how has the focus on, on the body um, changed your perspective now on these other areas that you work in? Um, the, the, the really microscopic detail that we got to um, with inflammation. Um, well, Rupa, it was an honor to be working with you uh, and uh, every morning for us to be, you know, getting the, this book on a keel by our conversations at five in the morning uh, before our kids woke up. And uh, uh, part of that process of collaboration was itself an opening of uh, a process of writing that, that had been very solitary and very kind of uh, insular and, you know, plucking from whatever places that were all about the self for me. And pluralizing that writing was super exciting and pluralizing the writing process and collaborating in a way that was equitable and fair and navigated the bumps on the way was incredible. And I am so grateful to you for that. Uh, and I mean, in terms of the substance of what we learned, I'm grateful to you too for the, the example that really comes to mind is the, the example about debt. Um, just because as, an, you know, as someone trained as an economist, uh, I, I almost made the mistake of saying I was an economist, I'm not, and I, I don't want to be. Uh, but uh, as someone trained in that discipline, it's one thing to understand that debt causes stress, causes despair, uh, and in some cases causes suicide. That was the, the arc of uh, work that I did in, in Stuffed and Starved, where we saw farmers in India suffering under immense levels of debt and uh, in the end, for some suicide and for many, many others, drug abuse was a way out of this, or appeared to be a way out of this despair. Uh, but to understand as you do, the pathways that lead in and out of the body uh, and the ways through, the, the, the ways that, that this stress and suffering and capitalist oppression flows through our bodies in long colonial histories, in and out again, uh, it is mind blowing. And then to learn on top of that, that there are medical ways of reducing the suicide rate by 2% uh, and reducing the accidental overdose rate by 9%. And that is to ban payday loans. You know, you, it, it, the, the, you really helped me complete uh, a, a sort of understanding of how it is that, that the, the, the sort of capitalist class warfare, particularly directed against BIPOC communities and working class communities, uh, makes its way through our bodies, but also how broad a world, uh, the, the, the possibility of um, understanding health as the route to transformative food systems might be. Uh, and I'm so grateful for that, for, 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 for that wisdom. So thank you. Aww. So, I mean, Rupa, I'm, I'm uh, curious, but this is your first book. I'm, I've been through this veil of tears before. Um, but in, in the process of turning your activism and your music and uh, your, your medicine into words that can you know, transform in the way your music and medicine can, uh, what surprised you most about the, the challenge of learning this, this new um, you know, way of, of reaching and healing people? It was very humbling, the process of writing, um, especially writing with you, Raj, um, which was which was great for me um, to have an opportunity to uh, just, you know, spend three days writing a thousand words um, very carefully and then just getting rid of all of them because they didn't quite get at what, what I was trying to say. So that process of um, understanding, you know, while we have a book of 300-ish words here, sitting right here, there's another book of 300-ish words <laughs> that is in our, you know, our, our <laughs> I, um, I was surprised by um, by the ways in which um, translating what I'd seen at the bedside of so many people, so many people suffering, um, that got was was able to be conveyed um, through your analysis, Raj, um, of history and social dynamics, and also through actually having the time. And I'm grateful um, to both Jenna King and Nancy Schaub for providing me with the time to sit down and read 
the histories and to read the doctrines of discovery and to read the medical um, experiments on animals that lay the foundation of our ways of knowing in medicine and to be struck by the violences of all of these things um, and to understand the roots of what I was seeing in the bodies of patients over the last 20 years and was intuiting in the communities that I would be working in as an activist and as an artist and as a doctor, um, actually making those connections and to seeing that they weren't just simply metaphors or they weren't just simply colorful ways of speaking, these um, systems of oppression were actually changing the ways in which our immune cells are acting. And COVID, perhaps the most surprising way thing of the book was that everything that we wrote was being um, manifest in real time as we were writing it. So as we were going back and looking at colonial histories, we were seeing the you know rates of death and despair in Navajo Nation and our Diné friends and community members, as we were looking at the histories of uh, medicine on enslaved people, the experimentation on particularly black women without anesthesia, we're reading stories about how black mothers are 12 times more likely to die in New York City after having a baby. And so just the um, part that for me was uh, one of the other things that was so surprising was the way nothing had changed over 600 years. Um, the environmental destruction, the, um, the degradation of black, brown and indigenous communities around the world was being brought to such a razor sharp focus through COVID um, and through you know, what, we were, what, we were, what, we were, what we were witnessing. Also during the writing of this book, we lost both uh, LaDonna um, or Lakota, Dakota um, uh, leader from Standing Rock and Deborah Whiteflume, another uh, you know, red warrior um, leaders um, who have really influenced me and taught me and um, to understand how the ongoing um, experience of colonization um, is, is still here, it's still ongoing and, and to really, um, you know, just sit, I was, I was grateful for all the time I got to just sit with the teachings that have been offered to me from elders in different communities and really let them sink in and, and see how they, they situated themselves in these puzzle pieces we were bringing together from um, economics and ecologies and um, immunology and, and all these systems. So I was um, you know, very humbled in this process and it's still hard to write, um, but um, I feel very grateful for the opportunity to have done this with you. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I believe it now would be the, the, the time where you throw me a question that I have no idea what's coming next. Well, Raj, what do you hope readers will do when they finish the last page of this book? Well, read the footnotes, obviously, uh, and then the bibliography <laughs> and then the acknowledgements, because uh, we spent a shit ton of time on all of those. Um, and look, I mean, we're at a book launch. This is a moment of just being grateful. Uh, and I, I do want, uh, if you make it to the last page, you'll, you, you should hopefully come uh, away feeling like you can do something. Uh, and perhaps one of the first things you can do is be grateful. And again, we, we began this evening being grateful for the land that we're on. Uh, I'm on, uh, I'm in occupied te Texas and uh, this land is a palimpsest of, of uh, the the, the uh, you know the Comanche Empire, uh, the Tonkawa people, and you know uh, civilizations before them too. But I also want to thank you know, and, and I, I know Rupa, you do too, the the, the 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 reproductive labor and the care that allowed us to write uh, our partners, our children, our families, uh, and those communities of care are ones to which we return and we must return and we must build. Uh, if you look in the chat uh, for, for, for y'all on here now, you'll find organizations filled with care as a purpose. That care is, you know, the, the organizations that you see here are ones to join. Um, there are other organizations that are part of the transformation and the care revolution that needs to come after this book, right? We, we, we talk about colonialism and capitalism, but what that really means is the imposition of a cosmology, a regi regime that 
permits us, encourages us, schools us on how not to care for one another, how not to care for uh, a range of social hierarchies of, of, of people of color, BIPOC communities, of women, of indigenous people in particular, uh, as we talk about in the book, and their territories, uh, and to, to not care about the web of life. If we are to uh, come away from this book with anything, I, I think what, what I'm hoping for is an idea about care that uh, recognizes that, you know, inflamed doesn't come with its own diet, right? There's no infl anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, we, I mean, like Rupert, I imagine you could make a bajillion dollars if you just got on the gram and offered a pill that, that cured inflammation, uh, but didn't have to trouble people with coming to terms with the fact that we're settlers on this land or that uh, we don't have to transform the relationship we have with the web of life. Uh, and some doctors we know have gone that route, but that's not what this book's about. This book is about taking a relationship to where we find ourselves, whether we chose it or not. Uh, so I will be spending the rest of my life dealing with patriarchy and that's not a, a duty. Uh, well, no, it's, it's not a, an onerous duty. It is a duty of liberation. Uh, it is uh, what it is that needs to happen in order for me to be free is to wrestle forever with the patriarchy with which I have grown up and which I reproduce. Uh, and that's just a thing. Uh, but that's not something I can do as a solo effort. This isn't a therapy book. This is a book about movements. And it is a way for settlers like us to uh, uh, recognize and understand how to be in solidarity and comradeship with uh, indigenous movements here in uh, in what is now called the United States, but also about how to take a relationship to class, to race, to gender, to uh, our history of in this uh, occupied land using far more fossil fuel than uh, is our fair share and having contributed historically far more than uh, you know comrades in the global south. There are movements ready to do that, including one uh, that I'm hoping we'll get to talk about, the Deep Medicine Circle. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not gonna lob you that softball. Uh, well, maybe I am. I, 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 my, my last question before we move into Q&A uh, to you, Rupert, is this. So we've gone through this book um, and we're, I mean, it, it has changed us. What are you doing differently now than when, when we started working together? Well, I'm drinking less coffee. Um, I'm rehabilitating my gut microbiome, which has been slaughtered by <laughs> the stress of this last year. I'm taking care of myself. So starting, um, even though our book is not a self-help book, the uh, radical importance of caring for ourselves as, as movement workers, as people who are in there um, slogging away against uh, police violence and, and racist structures that are hurting our community members, and I'm doing that care with community members who are struggling. So I'm, I'm very happy to be working with Greg Castro um, on a land rematriation project on a 38 acre farm. Um, we started an organization called the Deep Medicine Circle. And what I'm doing differently is listening to land um, and really listening to um, the, the words and perspectives of Greg sitting by a fire. Um, and and understanding you know what it what it means for him to come back in relationship to his land and what is my role in supporting um, him and his family reconnecting and reintegrating how do I support that um, and then how do I work with uh, the incredible Sage Lapena who's come onto our organization as our director of traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous plant medicine doctor how do I work with her to form a a decolonizing medical clinic there on the land. Um, and we imagine it'll take us about two years to be putting this into practice, but she's an amazing plant medicine, uh, a practicing plant medicine person, Nam Te Pam Wintu in Pomo. And um, it's been amazing to sit and listen um, to her describe the medicine of plants and and listening to the land and listening to what's happening. So there's just uh, practicing the art of listening, which doctors are really bad at. Um, my training as a physician has made me really bad at listening. My training as a musician has made me somewhat better. Um, but 
it's it's something that I'm I'm doing differently, and I'm I'm really grateful for this opportunity to be working on this land project. It's exciting um, because it is uh, transnational, uh, because Greg understands that I'm a refugee of colonial capitalism myself, born in his homelands. Uh, my parents came here from Punjab. Um, they came here because so much money was taken from our homelands by the same invasive forces that came here. Um, it, and so it's, you know, realizing how we've all been orphaned from this earth in different ways. And we're all trying to find our way in dignity and in solidarity, um, you know, in, into, into better relationships. So I'm trying to work on those right relationships, both where I live here in Chichenyo territory and where I'm um, working and starting to work more with land and Ramatichuoni territory. That was a softball question, wasn't it? Um, but uh, he, the, the joy is now we're moving into the audience Q&A. Uh, if, again, if you look in the chat, not only will you see organizations you can join, uh, but also, uh, a comrade has helpfully posted a link to uh, Indra. Thank you. Uh, a, a link to the Deep Medicine Circle and how you can donate, uh, which I thought was was very enterprising. So thank you, Indra. Um, also, we we've, we've got our first question from from Jeff. Uh, and rather than suffer uh, everyone to, the, the, to to suffer the rigmaroles of muting and unmuting and spotlighting and what have you, Jeff, if you if you forgive me, I'll, I'll just read it out. Uh, and the question is, how do the health outcomes from income and wealth inequality? express themselves on a cellular, le cellular level. Telomere shortening and other pathways, how does this happen? What are the most important biological pathways? And how do you best teach this to others, both from healthcare and in other uh, domains? Can I take a shake at this, Raj? This, um, yeah, so cool. one, one thing I, I learned about that I was really fascinated about, so we're learning in medicine how, in science and medicine, how, um, all the diseases that we're looking at in industrialized um, societies are diseases where inflammation plays a role and it's systemic chronic inflammation. And we've learned that cells, um, immune cells as they age, usually as they age, they enter um, cellular senescence where they stop dividing and they just become old cells that are hanging around waiting to be pulled out of circulation. But when immune cells are subject to damage repeatedly, um, whether it's DNA damage, environmental damage, or damage from stress, um, those cells, um, and by that I mean psychological stress, not just um, stress uh, like a biological, whoa, whatever, um, the biological stress is how psychological stress is uh, communicated to our cells. But that even through the stress of not having enough money to pay your rent or the threat of eviction that's looming over millions of people in this country right now, um, that forces a cell. So when a cell has encountered that kind of damage over its lifetime, instead of just going into cellular senescence, it goes into this kind of um, change where it becomes a hyper secretor, a factory of pro-inflammatory cellular mediators. And that those cellular mediators circulate throughout the body and they're driving the changes we see in Alzheimer's disease, in chronic kidney disease, in diabetes, and all of these diseases. So that to me was a really interesting um, thing to realize that we have these cells that age, there's a normal process of aging, and then there's this senescence associated secretory phenotype that we describe in detail in the book. And the book can get highly technical at times. And I just encourage you not to be afraid. You can put it down, you can take a breath, you can step back to it. If you don't understand it, you can go online and look and read some more about it. Um, but, I, but we shared this information so that you could see the literal connections that we were seeing. Um, that this is not hypothetical, that this is molecularly based um, and that it's mutable. So this is not a biological essentialism that we're talking about. We're not saying that, you know, if you are from an oppressed class, you're going to be set up for this badness, but we're saying that social oppression, the social structures around the body, the body will respond with these ways. And so the essentialism ends up in the social construct so that if you want a, a different health outcomes, you have to start changing those social structures around the body. Um, so that's, you know, I hope that helps you uh, just as a first stab. There are um, 
there are uh, different pro, uh, different processes that do cause telomere shortening. Um, certain stories, like growing up with stories about being shot by the police, so the talk that um, you know that many black families might have in this country to protect their children, or the stories that you know your land was stolen and that you're no longer relevant in this society. These things have real impact on the body, and that's not to say that somehow people are genetically inferior. That is to say these things are a form of long-term biological warfare, and they need to be addressed as at that level of seriousness. Um, so that, you know, our black and brown and indigenous communities can um, be free from that kind of um, suffering in their bodies. Um, thank you, Rupa. The, 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 uh, we, we now have a ton of questions and I ju just to be clear, the, the, I'm, I'm going through them because uh, Rupa had a, a small technical difficulty. It means that she can't see the questions in a way that I can. Um, so I, I'm going to jump to the, to the next one from Carly, which is, uh, how do you two see child development and education intersect with deep medicine? And I'm going to go for this first, if you don't mind, because uh, there's in fact there's a ton, ton of physician-centered questions coming up for you next in a second, Rupa. So I, I'm going to uh, see if I can quickly knock uh, a, a short answer out about this, which is um, the story, uh, or, or, or rather, to, to ask the question back: How do you know that something is medicine? Uh, the only way that you know that something is medicine is because you have been schooled in ways of understanding that these things that come in bottles that you can't open are medicine. Whereas those things out in the garden or those things in the trees or in the river or the river itself are not medicine because you can just get, take that stuff and no one in a white coat has to license it. Now, part of our understanding of deep medicine is that it is about connection and care. And if that's the case, then education has everything to do with the, the arts of reconnection and of relearning the languages and the practices that we have in order to care for one another and the earth. So, you know, a, a small thing, and you know, here, here's how I was changed by this book in an entirely trivial way, but one that, that might be useful to talk about, which is, look, I, I was uh, feeling a, a little bit feverish and uh, not COVID fever, you know, but just a little bit under the weather. Uh, and my initial response was to use the language, oh, I'm fighting something off. Uh, but in the book, we talk about how this language of fighting and of enmity uh, and of warfare is part of the history of medicine and its divisions between the purity of the body and the, the mud of the external world. But mud's a good thing. And uh, so, you know, shifting from I'm fighting off to I'm learning to live with uh, is a different way of thinking about how our bodies are in time and space and in relation. And when we think about childhood education, we need to be thinking much more uh, about how food and medicine are not two separate realms, but one and the same, and not just food, but housing and care uh, and love and the, the air we breathe. And that I think is part of the transformation that we are calling upon the world to join us in when we think about deep medicine. Uh, but the problem, and this, this gets to a couple of questions from Julie and Deb, uh, is that the medical industry is so shot through with racism and with uh, capitalism and its history of, of uh, you know, it, its imbrication and its origins in uh, you know, slavery and the oppression of indigenous people. Uh, so can, how can physicians working within this entirely corrupted system push true transformation, Rupa? Those are good questions. That's Dr. Deb Cohen asking that question. I be. <laughs> um, incredible. Um, the one who, uh, she's an OBGYN faculty at UCSF who brought in my second baby. Um, and <laughs> and also see. from Julie Thompson Dobkin as well. That's right. So can medicine be transformed? Um, well, I'll just share that this week I had a very challenging 
and heartfelt conversation with one of my black medical students, a woman who is also a scientist who um, doesn't think it can and doesn't want to subject herself to the indignities of learning a science that is based on the, um, the violation of so many um, black women before her. Um, and I can't, you know, what I can't argue with that. I can't say, um, I can't say, you know, um, no, you know, just, you know, hold your breath and go through it so you can have, you know, an opportunity to change it. Um, I have to just listen and hear um, her struggle and support her in her understanding. Um, so I, you know, myself, I am very excited about the work that I've been doing with indigenous communities um, who've asked me to work with them and um, who've invited me in to look at what decolonizing medicine looks like in an actual practice outside of the hospital in a new created space. In a space that's created um, with different architecture, with different um, intention and um, starting from a different place. Um, I will bring with me my perspectives as a Western medically tra a medical trained person um, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how those perspectives can be loosened and opened and shifted and, and changed. Um, and I, I don't know yet um, if it can be or if it's something I have to entirely walk away from. I don't, I don't my intuition says there's a place, uh, an important place for the science and medicine that I've learned. Um, my intuition also says it has been so much a part of violence um, against black, brown and indigenous people. It never was built to serve them and it still does not. Um, and so let's create alternatives. Let's create um, new imaginings of medicine or old imaginings or um, new um, iterations. And so for me as an artist, person, thinker, activist, uh, and, and, and lucky to be in like, long-term community with different folks, uh, this is the fertile edge. This is the edge um, of, of my imaginings that I'm excited about um, because I see in them, um, and probably this comes from my interest in music where I write in several languages, I bring together several um, musical idioms from the places that I've lived and the, and the things that I've heard in the environments where I've lived is that um, plurality of thought and that plurality of conversation and, and, and in that mixture is this very rich uh, possibility of understanding that doesn't exist in um, you know, the confines of the Western medical architecture. Um, so for myself as a woman of color, as a woman from you know, colonial histories myself, colonized histories, um, the, the potential for um, other kinds of healing encounters feels much more exciting and, and rich to me there. Thank you, Rupa. Uh, uh, Deb G G Cohen mentioned that, that uh, it says, Rupa, you brought in your own baby. I was just there for the party. Uh, so <laughs> Just, just so you know, um, we're, we're coming up on the hour, uh, and I, I just wanted to also acknowledge that James Williamson uh, has written uh, a, a very deep and moving um, uh, uh, description of, of the struggles around housing, um, and also about uh, a, a neighbor uh, who grows three different kinds of plants in her small garden in front of a modest apartment, uh, uh, and mint for tea, a plant for colds, and a plant for diabetes, and she's originally from Haiti, as are many of those who come to enjoy the healing properties of these plants, which is officially not allowed by the tyrannical Cambridge Housing Authority, uh, just half a mile from the home of Elizabeth Warren. Um, and, and maybe that's a place uh, for us to both acknowledge the idea, uh, first of all, that there is such a thing as a commons, despite uh, you know, uh, th these authorities' attempts to, to, to crush it out. Uh, but th there, there is a commons. Um, and when it comes to, to health uh, and to, you know, the, the transformative possibilities of learning different ways of health, we have amazing leaders around us. Uh, joining us on, on, on the call is uh, Meredith Palmer, uh, uh, who uh, helped uh, inform our understanding around uh, health and uh, uh, the, the the possibilities of 
for example, schooling to understand the, the healing power, for, for instance, of strawberries. So the, thank you, Meredith. Uh, and thank you for, for schooling us uh, in our chapter on, on reproduction. You can read a lot more about Meredith's work and her uh, incredible scholarship there. But I, I, I guess I, I just wanted to uh, just sort of th th end with this idea that the commons is one of the ideas that, that, that we are very excited about, uh, very excited that Mordecai is here to, uh, to bring those decolonial de understandings of the commons with us today. Uh, and just uh, to, 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 to thank everyone who's joined us and to offer you, Rupert, the, uh, the, the final words uh, as we head to the top of the hour, um, but to thank everyone for, for being here today. Thank you. Um, yes, I, thank you, Raj, for writing this book with me. Thank you to our publishers and our agents and to our beautiful families for all the love and support they gave us so that we could do this work. <laughs> thank you for my parents for having me here in Ramatish Ohlone territory. Thank you um, to all of our friends who are here. Um, to go back just for a second to that childhood development question, um, as we write in our chapter on reproduction, we, we talk about the reproduction of colonial society and that's happening in our institutions like the schools, whether it's the violence of the boarding schools um, that tried to you know literally sever indigenous people from their histories and their children um, to the schooling we have today and what are we really teaching our children? Um, these, these are really important questions to contend with because that is how the colonial culture recreates itself. Um, and, and it's a great time to think of, you know, exciting ways to do things differently. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the book. Please, if you like it or hate it, write a review um, so we can hear your thoughts and continue our own evolution and thinking and growing as we um, continue our work to, de to decolonize our own society and our own selves and our own communities. Thank you.